Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today I'm going to talk about exotic vacuum objects in various Lena systems. And I have a list of people there that I'm going to look at various aspects of their systems, but principally focusing on the supernova reactor. So the experiments I'm going to focus on are that of Takaaki Matsumoto, and he did some palladium deuterium and nickel hydrogen electrolytic cold fusion with shock. Dr. George Eagley, and that's with the supernova reactor that we're going to run here shortly, and it's the 2.45 gigahertz microwave resonant chamber and dusty carbon-rich plasma. Bogdanovich et al. and their high voltage discharges through water stream. And Royashin Amaza, resonant vibrator node driven cavitation. And Lion, thermal heating of deuterium treated diamond in nickel matrix with high frequency component on the heater. So those are the systems. I've chosen these because they are extremely wide and varied. You have high DIDT, heating, cavitation, RF uh, driven and electrolytic. So you've got the full range of types of experiments that you might be aware of uh, in the broadest sense in the cold fusion and low energy nuclear reaction field. Now, I shared this image uh, a little while back and this was to show a comparison between the uh, work of Takaaki Matsumoto in his uh, nickel foil and ordinary water experiments and the supernova, the first uh, EVO that I uh, saw on um, the inside of the uh, outer clamshell of the supernova reactor. And uh, these are effectively similar scales and uh, you can see that the inside uh, areas here uh, are very well um, proportioned, uh, equivalent. They have these little uh, double ridges, uh, double ridges, these segments, uh, and so forth. And he actually describes this as many colorful rings were recorded on the back surface of the nickel foil. Uh, you can't see the color in any of the available documentation that I can find because it's all printed in black and white. However, we can see kind of what he meant because I have taken these with the uh, Dynalite H3 and that gives me the ability to see things in color. And as you can see here, this is a color image of the Evo spot. And I've overlaid uh, some geometry there. I'm just going to click that so it plays. Now here is the supernova reactor. And where this was found uh, was in this outer clamshell CNC machined piece of aluminium. And it's on the inside surface. And so in theory, this is an impact mark. And what you will see as we work through this presentation is quite a number of these where I've been able to capture them head on with the Dynalite. You can see these inner areas, these outer areas, and then this uh, area that doesn't seem to be affected or it's affected very differently from the surrounding area around this. So what I'm highlighting here is uh, this kind of hexagon outside area. Um, and also there seems to be a hexagon, but it's also, it's kind of like, it's rotated like 30 degrees. So the points here are in the center uh, point of each of these uh, edges of the hexagon. It's actually softer than that, and you'll see this uh, as a pattern through the um, different uh, exotic vacuum object spots that you'll see. So I'm calling this a hexagon field. This area here is the hexagon field. Here's a one, this is a new one, and this is again on the inside. And when we play this one, you'll see that um, I've lit this uh, with the uh, quadrant lights of the dino light. And so it's, you can see these two spots here that's in front of my finger, and it's rolling around a tip here. And the reason this is of interest to me is that that kind of points to this lump being very pointy at this top here. <laughs> Uh, so it's getting that reflection. Now, secondly, the, you've got these lights going round here and then reflecting in this bowl. So um, th there seems to be a ridge around here and then a, a cavity in here. And it's almost like this is kind of spinning around like this. The outer section is similar to the one that we saw previously here, where it's segmented. Now, the implication is that maybe that in the center of this, there was a, a glassy blob uh, that has broken away and it might have looked something like this. So this might be a, a slightly more full representation of what actually uh, formed this and maybe something similar here. But anyway, 
What we can say is uh, that there are very clearly two areas, something going on in the center area here and something going on on the outside. And that's what we see there as well. Now, why I'm showing you this one uh, is because of this. This is uh, a thing called a plasmac, uh, and it was first uh, researched in, I think, 1973. And there's a patent here um, which has expired. I think it's from uh, 1996 or 1997, something like that. Um, anyway, so uh, you can see the image that we had uh, uh, in the previous slide. Uh, with this what I'm calling as a point coming out here and a pit going there uh, almost like this is spinning around and I've rotated and aligned this with a, another sort of uh, uh, image where I have um, used the uh, polarizing filter on the dynolite so you get a different impression of the shape that's going on there and I want you to look at the comparison between this and the diagram of the uh, plasmac as uh, produced in uh, presentation by Paul Collock. In fact, what I've done in the next slide is I've taken a description of this structure from the patent. And these are the original um, drawings from the October the 24th submission in 1973 of the US patent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through this. A plasmac, PMK, has three major regions. An inner kernel 36, so that's 36 here, this sort of ring here, this ring here, this ring here. A vacuum field region, 26 here, 26 here. So this area is a vacuum field area. And a mantle, 28. So this area here, this sort of outside of the ball as it were. In a kernel 36 is a single toroidal current loop. So this current loop here, 36. The mantle 28 is composed of ionized material and is surrounded by a fluid 10. So this is the fluid such as an atmosphere or gas. The vacuum field region 26 separates the mantle, this area here, and the kernel. Figure 3 and 4 uh, provide more detail of the inner kernel. The plasma kernel 36 produces a poloidal magnetic field with, within and around it, illustrated by flux lines 34. So it's going in and around it. This is 34. These are the flux lines. They're the flux lines in that diagram. A circular surface current 38 circulates about the minor axis. So you have uh, this 38 here. So it's got this uh, poloidal circular surface current. Uh, and it's around this little axis, not this big axis, but the little axis uh, here, throughout the volume of the toroidal kernel. These currents 38, these currents 38, result in a toroidal magnetic field within the heart of the kernel 36. So this is a um, toroidal a magnetic uh, field. So you have a, this magnetic field going around in here, and you also have this magnetic field going around here. And these are represented by the flux lines 40. So there we go. The mantle 28 has a generally ellipsoidal shape surrounding the kernel 36. So they've got the kernel and the mantle is ellipsoidal. It's represented more like a sphere here, but uh, he's saying it's ellipsoidal, substantially as shown in figure one. This configuration is a substantially stable one in that the kernel 36 exists in a vacuum field region 26 and thus does not dissipate rapidly. The kernel current also produces a strong poloidal field represented by the flux lines 34, supporting the ionized particles in the mantle 28. This prevents the mantle 28 from collapsing into the vacuum field region 26. So it's saying basically these field lines stop the mantle from collapsing into the kernel. However, the mantle 28 is prevented from expansion because the pressure of the internal poloidal field reaches equilibrium with the fluid pressure of the external fluid. So this is pushing out and the fluid is pushing in and there's an equilibrium reached. A weak poloidal current 44 may exist which circulates around the mantle 28 so this is our uh, weak uh, poloidal current, and it threads through the center of the toroidal kernel. So it goes weakly around there and then through the center, weakly around there and through the center. 
following the flux lines of the poloidal field generated by the kernel 36, as illustrated in figure 2. The poloidal current, 44, results in the formation of a toroidal field within the vacuum field region, 26, as illustrated by flux lines, 46. So it's these flux lines here, 46. The sum of the toroidal and poloidal fields is not shown. The vacuum field region within the plasmac hinders the kernel current from losing conductivity due to diffusion of current particles. As a result, the kernel may exist for a period of time during which its energy losses are limited to high temperature radiation to the mantle. So the energy losses from the kernel are just those radiated through the vacuum to the mantle. The plasma configuration does not depend on any external electric or magnetic fields for its existence or stability. Rather, it is similar to a charged battery in that it is able to internally store or retain magnetic energy for a period of time depending on its conductivity, surrounding fluid pressure, and its internal energy content. The charged particles forming the ionized mantle generally will not penetrate the intensive poloidal field generated by the circulating current forming the kernel. Thus, physical fluid pressure can be exerted on the mantle for compressing the mantle. However, compression of the mantle will force compression of the poloidal field and will result in increasing the energy and temperature of the kernel. Accordingly, the internal temperature of the energy of the PMK plasmac, a plasma, may be increased by applying mechanical fluid pressure to the exterior surface of the mantle. If a gas or liquid is used to apply fluid pressure to the mantle, particles will diffuse through and penetrate the mantle. However, these particles will become ionized as they are exposed to the intense heat radiated by the kernel. Thus, in effect, these particles will become part of the mantle and will be unable to penetrate the magnetic field within the plasmac in large quantities. Therefore, the near vacuum conditions in the vacuum field region will be maintained by the inherent internal energy of the compound plasma configuration. Thus, the plasma is unique in that it establishes an interface between the mechanical pressure and circulating plasma current. So what does the claimant think that this can be used for? Well, I'm going to go and look at the uh, patent uh, for this. And one thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this breakout of the uh, actual, the, the mantle structure. And it shows that there's a very defined inner region uh, and then there's this sort of area here that kind of becomes increasingly diffuse and this is the gas on the outside. And it's described quite well here. But I'd like to show you some of the other things that this is claimed to be able to provide. Firm, firstly, it says a thermal thrust engine. Then it says electrical power generation. And then they have a plasmac hyperdrive. And then they have an inductive magnetohydrodynamic uh, uh, power production, I su suppose. So here we have something that is produced by high current discharges, and it forms a self-sustaining plasma that then can be used to generate uh, heat, light, uh, and electricity. And also in the paper, it says that it can do transmutation of matter. So that is that. The, actually, here is the original patent. and. Uh, you will see things that will remind you of other authors if you read that. And I've discussed this in a previous video. Okay, so back to the main presentation. And the reason I am showing you this is that this may help you think about what you're seeing in what I've already shown you and what I'm going to show you in the coming slide. So here is another of what I consider an Evo strike mark, and I'm calling this mesh-like structures because it's going to be a series of these images. And why I'm saying it's a mesh-like structure is it looks like a kind of a net or a mesh in the centre here, and it'll be more clear why I've called it mesh-like structures moving forward. But anyway, um, again it has a hexagonal kind of field interference area and this is why I think it's important to consider this concept because you have this vacuum field area 26 between the toroid and the outer um, mantle as it were. So here we have uh, the structure and if I uh, press uh, forward you'll see that uh, you get the glassiness and when you are looking at it with the um, polarizing filter on it looks like it's an impression. Anyway 
It's very striking the way the surrounding area is not influenced under the polarizing filter, uh, whereas this inner region is, and then there is a very distinct boundary between this region and uh, uh, the actual central structure, whereas it's more fuzzy on the outside, and this kind of does um, fit the notion of the plasmac, although unlike the first one that I showed you where the structure could maybe be something like they were considering the inside of these exotic vacuum objects to, to be structured, here it's much more complex, implying that there is something more interesting going on within the internals of these things. Here is another one, and uh, unlike this one, which has a hexagon sort of a field impression, this uh, has a pentagon uh, field impression. And so I will play this likewise. Again, you can see the mesh-like structure inside. So let's play this. And it's very blobby. So you have this mesh-like areas in here, but you also have these kind of blobby bits on the outside. So there seems to be a central area and then attached onto the outside of these other sort of blobs. And again, you can see the uh, sort of field outside area. Here is the third of these mesh-like structures. And here it's quite interesting because it has a hexagon, but it's truncated. So you can imagine if these uh, lines were extended a little bit more, then it would be a standard sort of hexagon. And it has, again, this striking uh, boundary between the, the sort of inner area uh, and uh, the mesh-like structure, uh, and the outer areas are slightly more fuzzy. So I'm going to play this. Now, all of the images uh, and the GIF animations and the uh, animations as uh, MP4s are available to download. And if you go to the description of this video, you will see uh, a PDF which you can download. And in there, there will be the links and all the links that are given to all the papers and stuff in this presentation. Those are not the only mesh-like structures that we have seen. Uh, if you remember, uh, during Project Omar, when I was uh, analysing the plates, these plates here, these vibration plates, uh, I found these kind of bubble-like structures, and the bubble-like structures had a kind of field area around them. And it was quite interesting to me when I found these, because it reminded me of this Fusion Technology article by Takaki Matsumoto where he also saw these kind of mesh-like structures, and he specifically called it observation of mesh-like traces on nuclear emulsions during cold fusion. And I have it here in his book. This is his book, and uh, it is here, this very same structure. And this is similar, in my opinion, to these kind of structures that we are seeing here. And I want to thank Felix Schalkman for doing this uh, comparison image between the two from uh, Project Omar and the Matsumoto structure. Now Takaki Matsumoto say that the actual lines that you're seeing here are actually comprised of uh, itonic clusters of electrons. So he's actually saying that these bands here, and I presumably if these are the same things, these, these ridges and lines here, the actual structure of the mesh they are supposedly made by itonic electrons. Now, this brings me to Bogdanovich's work, and this is at the National Research Nuclear University uh, in Moscow. And he says here, and what he is doing is he's discharging uh, high voltage uh, pulses through some uh, water vapor, and he is seeing exotic vacuum objects form, typically in the toroidal or glowing ball sense. I pulled out this particular comment here because he says, a stream of particles, presumably electrons, which causes air to glow, a similar pattern is observed after the emission of electrons from the electron source or the injector through the foil, is emitted from the surface. After 10 to 20 seconds, this stream is formed into a set of several rings, five or six, of the same diameter, which rotate around both their own and common axis parallel to the plane, horizontal. He goes on to say that um, 
that this rolls on the surface. So uh, using this data and what I saw here, I was suggesting that these things, if they were rolling around on the surface, and we can see here that they can physically change and, and, and create craters within the surface. So if this was rolling around on the surface, it might leave these kind of zigzag tracks uh, that uh, we call strange radiation. So I suggested that these kind of structures might be one way that strange radiation is formed in these uh, elaborate kind of strange radiation tracks, more, more than just the tractor treads and, and sort of uh, semi um, elliptical uh, driven tracks. In fact, in a previous paper, and if you go to this video, you can see all the links in the description of my review of this paper uh, to his previous work, he's actually saying that these things form into crystal structures. And this does make sense when you uh, think of what we're seeing here. And so that there is the work of Bogdanovich, which I think is relevant to raise here. And again, here's some more mesh-like structures. Now, these are not taken so head-on, so it's not so easy to necessarily conclude that there's hexagons or pentagons there. Um, but if I press play here, Now here you can see the sort of inner structure, then a sort of secondary structure, and then a tertiary structure, and then this very strong boundary, and then this field area here with the soft edge to it. Here's another one. Again, this has a very defined central section and a bit of a blobby outside. Uh, with multiple segments, and then the the field area on the outside is quite soft. Again, so it wasn't easy to determine in what shape that was. Here's another one. This actually only really appears to have uh, the central area, which looks a bit like a pentagon, uh, and this outer area with segments around it. Um, some people may also uh, recognize uh, this structure here, which may or may not be a strange radiation track, but uh, I, that isn't the focus of this presentation. So here is a group of them, and I just wanted to give you an idea of how many there are. And you can see how, where it's hit the surface, you have these field areas around it. So in a previous presentation called Supernova Transmutation and Teleportation, I was suggesting that uh, we need to understand how the structures that we are seeing here on the inside of the clamshell of the reactor, the aluminium, are actually getting to this point. And uh, this is a core from the reactor. So if we can imagine that that is uh, here and there's a plasma ball in there, and when that gets to the inside surface, is it capturing material from the inside surface, i.e. not transmuting it here, but then putting it into a package which is neutral that then can travel through the quartz and then deposit the material that it captured from the quartz here on the inside of the clamshell? Or is it going through like ball lightning can do sometimes through glass and come to the outside edge and then grabbing material from the outside edge and then transporting it? Or is it actually transmuting here and then teleporting through? And by teleporting, I mean that it's wrapping it in a neutral package and able to transmit through material without causing a hole. Now, we do know from Shoulders' work that in Illumina, for instance, um, the, uh, the exotic vacuum objects were able to bore holes through the Illumina. So that is actually a possibility, and that's... Uh, one thing that I kind of want to discuss in the next part of this presentation. And I'm going to do that by looking at the Lion Reactor. Now, Lion is a researcher in London. So these images are from the Lion Reactor. This is a look at one sort of typical setup for, for the Lion experiment. And if you want to go and look at the playlist, you can click on the link here if you download this PDF. And also, I have an observation video of this particular structure here, which was from a run 
and it shows the inside of this quartz that you see here after a run and the outside of uh, the quartz after a run. And what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that you have kind of two spots and Ken Shoulders often observed Evos moving in pairs together. This is kind of like underneath this one and on the outside it's uh, on top of this one. So it's consistent between the inside and the outside shot. There are many things that are interesting here. There are cracks here, which are exactly 120 degrees apart. And on this one, you've got these uh, 60 degrees segments, uh, implying that this is a hexagon. The other thing that you have is these multiple sort of bubbles going around here, around this central area. So you have features that are very similar to the ones that are discussed, well, for instance, it's similar to this, similar to this one, uh, where you have a central area with many areas around the outside. And it's similar to the things discussed here where you, where you have six of these rings around a central point. Another thing that is interesting here is that this is much wider than the thickness of the quartz. So this diameter here, and particularly this double diameter here, is much wider than the thickness of the quartz. Yet, the actual outside surface of the quartz, this outside surface here, is completely smooth. So this structure, whatever it was, it was burrowing through from the inside, next to where the core of the reactor was, burrowing through. Now, it's it's not damaged down here. It wasn't like some copper leaked and, and started melting its way through. It was coming out of the side the side of the reactor and burrowing its way through and making these beautiful marks. This is on another part of a Lion reactor and the reactor core end is coming through to here. This is the end of the solenoid of the heater wire out here and this is coming out of the back end of uh, the reactor housing. And what you can see is these two white spots, again, one smaller than the other. Uh, you can see here, one is slightly smaller than the other. And these actually have a pentagon structure. And if you go to this link here, you can see where I've analyzed with the dynolite edge. And you can see this pentagon structure here. And there is a kind of pentagon here. And this, if you do contrast adjustment, you'll see there's a pentagon there. There's this very defined region in the middle, but there's also this area around here where there's a field interaction. Now, the really interesting thing about this is it appears to be made up of lots and lots and lots of substructures, which are like smaller versions of the overall st structure. And also that... Um, this appears to have, the field appears to be coming out of here and going down through there, down, down through there. So was this whole thing one big, let's say, plasmac? And uh, this is the sort of vacuum area. and Maybe there was a sheath around here. I don't know. It's a little bit interesting. Now, the other thing is that this here, it's highly affected on the top surface, but on the underside, it's not affected at all. So really, it's... it's it's come out of here and gone in there, but the interesting thing about this is this is on the outside and not at all on the inside. So unlike this where it's burrowing through from the inside and it comes to getting close to the outside and it kind of hasn't gone all the way through, in this case it actually went all the way through and maybe the electromagnetic structure got caught by the bend in this wire that was being fed electricity and it got caught there and maybe it got fed by the heat and the electrons and it grew there on the outside to affect the outside of the reactor outside of the actual core of the reactor itself and so the questions i have here is whether it was burrowing through all the way through and carried silicon from here don't know whether it was burrowing a little bit in and then took that package and dumped it here don't know was it transmuting in here and then teleporting through and dumping it here? Don't know. Or taking it from the outside. It's You have the evidence here to show these potential outcomes. Now, here is one similar, but this is on the inside of the supernova's aluminium clamshell. And again, you have a pentagon here and you have a pentagon here. And if I play this, you'll see... Um, it has a field area around it as well. Again, it's, it's, it's slightly at an angle, so it's difficult to get the, the field shape exactly mapped out.
Here's another one, and uh, this it again looks like it's two structures in there, not just one. And uh, it's got this ellipsoid shape and this glassy deposit around the outside. The other thing that's interesting is it kind of has this overall tear sh shape, which we've seen in a lot of different kind of experiments. And this is also almost like it's mirrored down here. You've got a, like the, <laughs> this might be the jewel and this is the anti-jewel over here. So this again is on the inside of the clamshell of the supernova reactor. Again, this is another one. This is on the inside of the Lion reactor and it's burrowing its way through from the inside. It didn't go all the way through the fused quartz tube. And this is some glassy deposit on the aluminium in the supernova reactor. So again, you have these kind of central kind of rings of material uh, eaten here. And in this case, eaten into the aluminium and deposited as maybe a glassy substance on the top but with these very defined kind of mesh-like uh, features going on. Now here's one that you could maybe consider as a hexagon field. Here's another one that's very blobby. Now in this case, and in some other cases, you will not see any field impression. And I'm speculating that in this case, the, the uh, exotic vacuum object had already started to uh, fall apart before it hit the surface. So you get this much less regular array of uh, deposit. Again, this is much less regular, but you can definitely see that there are multiple rings. In fact, interestingly, it's only on this side. There's no damage or, or deposit on this side. So maybe this one had started to fall apart. Maybe it came in at a different angle. Here's uh, two blobs. Uh, this one is very centrally located with almost a pentagon around the outside. So you can get the videos of EVOs that I previously shared through these links from the PDF and I'd like to show you in this case, this is one that I looked at earlier uh, and it looks very similar, you might think, to these. Uh, so if I can maybe rotate this and this is again another uh, Matsumoto paper but you have these blobs around the outside and the central area, blob around the outside, central area, blob around the outside, central area. So that is kind of what I'm suggesting here. And this for me would be the most simple form of exotic vacuum object, similar to the one that we saw on the John Hutchison sample. And this one I quite like because it, it appears to be very, very blobby and uh, it's like it's dumped a whole lot of these spheres as an aggregate that was going around as a large exotic vacuum object and it just went <laughs> So the source files for everything you've seen here, uh, please credit the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project and myself, Bob Greenier, uh, when sharing or using these, um, but uh, they are all in the top quality. A lot of work's gone into this, so for instance, you have to do uh, several focusing depths of field here, and then you have to composite those together to get something where it's all in focus. So a lot of work's gone into these. Uh, you have PNGs, uh, Photoshop files, GIF anims, and MP4s to use and to study. So thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video where I will be talking about how I'm going to work out whether these are transmuted materials or deposited materials uh, by doing things with the reactor and I'm going to need your help. The actual experiment, uh, the main purpose of the experiment, I will do another presentation on later in the week. So thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.